Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verse 159, which reads as follows. Atanan chetathakayira yatanya manusasati sudanto vatadhametha atahi kira duddhamo which means If one makes oneself, if one uh, does to oneself as one instructs others, then indeed such a well-trained one should train as others. For indeed, difficult, the training of this, it is the self, it is the self indeed that is difficult to train. Atta hi kira duddhamo. Dhamma. Dhamma is training. Sudanta, one who is well trained. Dhameta, makes other people train. Duddhamo, difficult to train. The self is difficult to train. Tamati, it's an important verb in Buddhism. The Buddha is said to be a purisadhamma sarati. Uh, a trainer. He is a trainer of those who are trainable. So this was told in relation to, in, in regards to a story of a monk called Padhani, Padhani Katissa. Padhana means effort, so Padhanika is one who has effort. Tissa was his name, but they called him Padhanika, and it's an ironic name. It's, it's kind of a, a evidence that there might be a sense of humor among the, among the uh, compilers of the Pali canon or a sense of humor at the time, in the time of the Buddha. At the very least, it's a sign of... Uh, it's a sense of, uh, sense of shame, I suppose. It's how this monk is remembered, which is unfortunate because the story is actually quite unflattering to him, in regards to effort especially. So the story goes that uh, he received a, a meditation object, a practice of meditation from the Buddha, and together with a large group of monks, went off into the forest and entered into the rains. So right now we're in the rainy season, and this is a three-month period where we don't go anywhere. Well, we can go, but we can't stay overnight normally. We try to stay put for three months and focus on our practice. So that's what they did. And when they, when they were in the forest, the, this, this Padani Katissa, he says to the other monks, uh, we've, we've uh, received a meditation from the Buddha himself. Let us not, let us be appamatta, let us not be heedless, samana dhammang karodha. Do the duties of a samana, of a shaman, or a recluse, of an ascetic. And having said this, he went off into his room and, and lay down to sleep. And the other monks, in the first watch of the night, they, they did walking and sitting meditation as normal. To so understand the watches, we have uh, a 12 hour, I uh, know, Right, a 12-hour period. Right, The day has 12 hours, the night has 12 hours. So from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. is daytime. From 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. is nighttime. So the first watch is 6 p.m. till 10 p.m. approximately. And during that time, they did intensive meditation practice. It really put out effort. And then there's the, the, the second watch of the night from 10 a.m. 10 p.m. till 2 a.m. They went back into the into the residence, the dwelling, 
or their dwellings and, and lay down to go to sleep mindfully right as they were lying down or after they'd just fallen asleep this other monk having slept soundly wake, wakes up goes into the resident the other residences and sees the monks lying down to sleep and he bangs a drum or what does he do he uh, He just went and said to them, he said, Hey, what, did you come here thinking to yourself, we'll come here to sleep? He says, get back out there and devote yourself to the meditation. And so they all wake up and they're kind of groggy, and of course being woken up from sleep is worse than not having slept at all because you're dazed and confused. And, uh, they went out and they tried their best and stumbling around for the four hours when they'd normally be asleep. And in the third watch of the night, exhausted again, they lay down to sleep. And again this monk, having told them what to do, went back to sleep. And as soon as they lay down to sleep, or in, sometime in the third watch of the night, he gets up again and yells at them again and tells them to go out there. So they didn't get really to sleep at all. And after... Uh, of course, this other Padani Katisa got a lot of sleep. He slept through all three watches, basically, being interrupted, having to get up and instruct the other monks. Uh, so, and he did this repeatedly, basically every night. It sounds like, and uh, the monks, after after a while, you know, they they weren't getting anywhere with their meditation because they were constantly being disturbed and disoriented by lack of sleep, but also um, th this sort of uh, constant disruption of their ordinary sleep cycle, and they thought to themselves, "Wow, our, our this is really, really a tough practice. Our teacher must be, the elder must be a really, must be full of energy and, and you know, quite energetic if he's able to do this. Let's go watch him." And so they went, and they, they in this first watch of the night, they went to look into his room and found that he was sleeping. And they watched him, and when they realized that he was sleeping throughout the whole night, they felt like, they felt betrayed, of course. And they said, uh, you know, our, our teacher is teaching something that he himself doesn't even practice. It's empty words, they said. Ducha, what's it called? Uh... Tucharavang, empty rava, empty sounds, is empty words. And so, as a result of their, as a result of that, they they felt lost and they're disoriented, and they spent the rains retreat, not really gaining much out of it. At the end of the rains, they left and went back to see the Buddha, and the Buddha said, "Hey, how did it go?" Did you were you heedful? Uh, did you perform? Did you meditate well? And they told him the story, and he said, "Oh, this monk has always been like this." And he told a story of the, from the Jataka. This also appears in the Jataka, where he says, "Once this uh, monk was a rooster, and he was a rooster that had never been really taught when to crow, and so he crowed all day and all night uh, because he had no sense." It's the, one of the jatakas, and then he told. Then he told this verse. He said, "Look, this is the case. Someone before teaching, it's not really proper. It's obviously not proper if you haven't well developed yourself to go out and teach people, because it's difficult. What, what is really difficult is training yourself, training someone else. Well, obviously, it's easy. It's easy to tell other people what to do." Uh, and so let's talk about that a little bit. That's the obvious lesson here when we talk about how this relates to our practices in regards to the difference between teaching and practicing. But first, let's, first there's another point that also relates to our practice. It's in regards to, hey, what is proper practice? You know, sleeping, waking, being heedful, dedicating to yourself to your meditation. 
What's the deal with sleep here? Was this monk wrong in his teachings? Um, anyway, that, that that'll relate to the second part. But yes, the question of of what's the right amount of effort? So the Buddha taught, generally speaking, uh, for an intensive meditator to try and and um, get to the point where you can manage on four hours of sleep, manage only to sleep during the middle watch of the night. And that's not really a theoretical thing. You can see how that plays out in practice. For someone who's undertaking intensive meditation practice, four hours of sleep is really optimal. Um, in the beginning, it's difficult. And, and that's really the most important point here, is not exactly that this monk was advocating not to sleep, because four hours is optimal, but for someone who's truly in the zone, like really in, on a roll and, and in a meditative state, they don't really need to sleep at all. It's possible for them to go without sleep for long periods of time. And, uh, and this is also something you see, you hear stories about it, but you also have examples of, of people who continue to practice day and night. But the point is that they're really... They've, they've developed it, they've gotten, and they've cultivated that, right? And so really from my point of view, the, 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 well, the two problems, first of all that this monk was himself not a very energetic fellow, but also that, um, that there was no build-up to it, right? I mean these monks seemingly coming fresh off the boat, they hadn't really done much meditation or intensive meditation of this sort, and then to just dump them into a practice of not sleeping at all uh, is certainly not going to have positive effects, obviously. And then worse than that, he was waking them up in the middle of the night, in the middle of their sleep patterns, which is, um, you know, it's, it's disturbing. And to some extent, and most especially with a beginner meditator, you want to create a sense of, of comfort and routine. You, know, you want things to go smoothly and so it's more about reducing the amount that you need to sleep as you start to become more energetic and as you start to become more focused. And really this whole question about how much you should sleep is, is, is very much strongly dependent on your state of mind, right? and your state of body. If you're exercising a lot, your body's just going to shut down. But more importantly, if your mind is stressed, if your mind is stressed, you'll find it impossible to uh, stay alert, to stay focused, because you're taxing your system so, so, um, to such an extreme. You know, in our ordinary lives, living in a complicated society with all of our machines and, and computers and so on, it, it, it's not easy to get into this state where you're able to stay focused, stay awake, stay alert. Um, so it relates to our practice in terms of thinking about uh, how much sleep we need and having a sense of, of the potential goodness involved in, in less sleep. Uh, involved in this practice of getting to the point where you need less sleep. You know, certainly as someone who's, in the, who's really um, progressed in the meditation practices, needs a lot less sleep as a result. Um, so, it, so in that sense, it's not exactly wrong what this monk was teaching in the sense of, of advocating less sleep. Of course, he went about it all wrong. And that leads to the second part. So the question here, there's some questions involved. First, the first question is, can someone who's never practiced uh, actually instruct others? And uh, it's hard to believe, really, that um, some. That there's another story. It's not this story, but there's a story of a monk who had never really practiced at all, or maybe he had, but he hadn't gotten good results. And yet all of his students became enlightened. And that's hard to believe. And so there's more to this story than just someone teaching but not practicing. 
there's the fact that someone who ha doesn't practice or hasn't practiced is going to teach his students all wrong, right? I mean, this guy went about it all wrong. He'd heard, I guess, that one has to put out effort and be vigilant, and he'd maybe heard about monks who didn't sleep at all, and so he thought, well, that's what my students should do. And not having any experience in the training of the mind himself, he didn't have any sense of the gradual progression involved in that practice. So the idea that someone who hadn't practiced could uh, adequately teach their students, and the, the, the Buddha's last words about how difficult it is to teach, one, to teach others, um, I think it actually points to something else, because... For this guy, I think it's, it was quite difficult to teach others. I think it was near impossible for him to actually help other people. Uh, it's easy, I think, in regards to this story, it's easy to give advice. It's much harder to give advice that actually helps your students. Right? Anyone can give advice. But um, the other question here is of, of um, the question of the difficulty in teaching one, teaching yourself versus teaching others. And I think this is more of a, a problem for people who are on the path, you know, someone who has practiced and has gained results. It's easy to get distracted teaching others. And I don't think that's really what this, this story is talking about, because this guy went about it all wrong and clearly didn't have a good understanding of how meditation practice works. He ruined these other monks' meditation. But... I would really agree with what the Buddha says at the end about how easy it is, about how hard it is. What's really hard is teaching teaching yourself. It's it's quite easy for someone who does have positive results and, and meaningful results in the practice to teach others. Um, it's easy to give advice and say, hey, do this, do that. Uh, and it's it's a quite, quite a distraction on the path. And so there's two cautions here right, in regards to you know, how this relates to our practice as meditators. The first one is it's a strong encouragement to never ever ever teach another person uh, unless you yourself have gained something from the practice because the potential for you to teach it all wrong is, is incredibly great, is, is more likely. I've seen teachers and heard about teachers who, who are of this sort, whose students get on the wrong path because their teacher has never gained any understanding of how the practice works for themselves. But the second um, caution is that once you do get results, don't stop and don't get sidetracked into making your life all about teaching others. Our lives as, as Buddhists should be very much about our own practice. Uh, and you can go on and on and on teaching others. But what you end up with is a lot of people practicing on a very shallow level because no one ever gets, or will you never get, to, to understand the teachings on a deeper level. You have to push on yourself, work for your own salvation. And so this is really a problem for those who are on the path. Of course, for, for someone who has finished the path, who has become fully enlightened, they have nothing to do more for themselves, and often it can happen that they do spend a lot of their time helping others. Not always, I think. Quite often they're, well, they're certainly most content not to help anyone, but they often find themselves helping people much of their time because uh, there's such a demand on their uh, they're, they're in such high demand for their greatness and for their ability and understanding wisdom and so on mm. so two aspects first the caution and the, the importance of right understanding in regards to sleep 
in regards to putting out right effort. Now, let's be clear, the Buddha was advocating uh, intensive practice for 20 hours a day uh, and sometimes more, you know, practicing throughout the day and the night at times without sleep. Uh, but it has to be done right. And the second thing is in regards to teaching, which is really the primary lesson of this. Is don't get caught up in teaching. Certainly don't think about teaching others until you yourself have settled yourself in what's right. And even then, teaching is fine. It's good. But... Uh, it's not something that should take over your life to the point that you stop practicing yourself. So, another Dhammapada verse. Thank you all for tuning in. Wish you all the best.